Welcome to our 500th episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I am your host, Chris Brown, and today's guest is a guest that I have been meaning to get on for some time now, but I wanted to do it for a special occasion. So I thought 500th episode, let's go back to where the show started in Lloydminster, Alberta. When I first moved there, he was the very first provincial politician I ever spoke to and got my grips into Alberta. And that is the former member of the Legislative Assembly for Vermilion Lloyd Minster, the former Minister of Tourism, Parks and Recreation, the Honourable Richard Starkey. Richard, welcome to the show. Uh, Chris, uh, thanks very much for having me and congratulations on your 500th episode. That's, uh, that's quite a milestone. Well, thank you so much for that. And um, I want to start off the line of questionings the exact same way I started 499 other episodes off the same way. Richard, where did your sense of duty to serve come from? I think to a large extent, it, it, it came from my parents. Um, you know, my parents were both uh, immigrants to Canada. They came to Canada in the 1950s. Um, they both came from Germany. They met here in Canada. Uh, but uh, my mother had survived some of the atrocities of uh, Stalin in the Ukraine during the 1930s, my uh, my my uh, grandfather, my maternal grandfather, was actually um, removed forcibly from the village where my mother grew up uh, when she was 14 years old, and he was hauled out of the village and uh, never to be heard from again. And my father's history was that when he was 16 years, not even quite 16 years old, when he was 15 years old, uh, towards the end of World War II, he was handed a rifle and said, the Russians are that way, shoot everyone you can. And um, he was lucky to come home. Uh, two, two, of his, I mean, two of his friends that went along with him did not come home. And so when my parents came to Canada... And growing up in that household, my sister and I were instilled very strongly in a sense that you have a duty to uh, work hard to try to preserve the democratic rights and freedoms that we have and to not take them for granted, because in many countries, these things uh, are not a given. And certainly the uh, uh, the world that my both my parents grew up in uh was was you know had nowhere near the kind of opportunity or or uh, you know just general you know freedoms that uh, uh, we have here in Canada today and so you know right from a very young age my parents were very very active in volunteering in the community uh, whenever there was something to be done you know my parents would jump in and say yeah we we, we can help with that and uh, and so that that rubbed off on both my sister and myself you know this sense that. It, you, you you can't just be a passenger on, on this ship that's called society. You have to grab an oar and you have to pull. And, uh, and, and so that's always been something that's guided me throughout you know, my professional career and also through my time in politics. Volunteerism is one of those things that a lot of people tend to give back through that method, whether it be through nonprofit organizations, whether it be through their local community organizations, you name it, they try to give back in that way. Now, while I try to do research on my guest, I don't do a lot because I want to learn from you. I, I kind of know who you are. I, I've known you for some time now, and I know your list of volunteerism through your time in Lloydminster, even before your time getting elected provincially, even at City Hall, is extensive. Um, you made yourself known in that community as kind of the guy that people went to in Lloydminster to, if you need someone to help out, you go to Richard. Was that a big thing for you that you wanted to be known as that guy that you always were going to give back, going back to what you're talking about, your mom, your grandmother and your grandfather and your dad to say, you know what, no matter what, if I'm tired, I'm strung out, I'm still going to give back because that's what you do in a community like uh, Lloydminster. Well, it's, it's, it's never something that I really, you know, I would say sought out. I mean, opportunities always came up and presented themselves to you, you know, where, where there were things you could get involved with. I, I mean, one of the first groups that that both Allison and I uh, got involved with as soon as we, uh, you know, as, as soon as we got married and, and settled in Lloydminster was uh, the Little Theatre Lloydminster group. Um, 
you know, this is a little amateur theater company and uh, Allison has extensive experience in drama. I, I have much, much less, uh, but uh, they were looking for, you know, people who would be prepared to take on uh, the task of, of, you know, directing one of their productions. And, and Allison jumped in and said that she would. And, uh, you know, I, I helped out as much as I could in building sets. And I had a tiny, tiny little role that, that, entirely befit my acting abilities and Allison directed this production and it was a it was a huge success uh, and this was within a year of us arriving uh, you know getting married and, and being in Lloyd Minster um, and you know from that um, yeah I got elected to city council in 1985 um, through that you get to know a lot of people and that was a really good way but just through 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 our practice through veterans how practice. long after sorry to interrupt how long after did you were, did you move to Lloyd Minster? Did you get elected to City Hall? Because you got elected in 85, if I'm not mistaken, 85, 86. But wh when did you move to the city and when did you decide to, like, what year did you get first elected? Sure. So I, I graduated from veterinary college in April of 1983. Uh, my first day at the Lloyd Minster Animal Hospital was May 9th of 1983. And I was elected to Lloyd Minster City Council in October of 1985. So I had been in Lloyd for not quite two and a half years. And um, at the time that I ran, I was 25. Uh, I know that there were a lot of people saying, you know, who, who is this guy? Because I was still relatively new. And I was also quite young. They had never seen anyone my age run for city council. Uh, but uh, I ran and I said, you know, you know, what the heck, you know, we'll try. And Allison and I door knocked the entire city which at the time was unheard of. Nobody door knocked for a civic election in Lloyd Minster, at least. Uh, but we door knocked the entire city. And, um, uh, you know, I, I managed to, of the nine candidates that were running, I think I had the fourth most votes uh, and uh, served then two terms on council and really enjoyed it. And, you know, and while on council, got involved with, you know, various other things. You know, I coached youth soccer, mostly because, my sons were both playing soccer. I uh, helped coach basketball because Roland uh, uh, Roland played basketball. Then I got involved quite heavily in speed skating and, and coaching uh, speed skating and being an official for amateur speed skating because Alistair was heavily involved in speed skating. And uh, you'll remember that, Chris. And, um, you know, other, uh, you know, other opportunities to volunteer came up. I, I joined Rotary, uh, the Rotary Club in 1988. And so that always gave you lots of opportunities to do things in the community, to support the community. Um, I was uh, involved in the founding of our German Heritage Society in 1992, which was a lot of fun because we run the Oktoberfest every year. <laughs> and, and then um, one of the other things I, I got involved with um, or just after uh, we got back from my sabbatical year in Germany is uh, I got asked to serve on the Lloyd Minster Region Health Foundation. And that was a really, really interesting and really a growing experience because that was sort of my closest exposure prior to getting elected with how the healthcare system, at least in Lloyd Minster, which is a unique situation, um, how it works and, and what the instances are where it doesn't work. And there are certainly cases where there are gaps and and we still continue to work on some of those things that, that uh, in Lloyd Minster are, are a concern. I, I know that during my time as a reporter at the Lloydminster Source, the now defunct Lloydminster Source, I should say that, um, that was one thing that you tried to advocate a lot for was you and Tim McMillan, the member of the Legislative Assembly for Saskatchewan's for the Saskatchewan side of Lloydminster, worked very hand in hand in dealing with that health care issue in the city. But before we get into provincial politics, I want to go back to that very first election in 1985, because we all remember our first election, the very first time you put your name on a ballot. Um, you're this young guy, you're 25. What was the desire to put your name forward in 1985? Was there an issue that you can remember that you said, you know what, this I believe I could best represent this issue at City Hall? Or was it just... I, and I hate to use this word because I don't think you have one as, as much as politicians seem to do e an ego issue. And you say, OK, let, what's the next step for me? I'm a business owner here. I, I live in Lloydminster. Let's let's go and become a city councillor or an alderman at the time. 
Oh, okay, so to start, there was no single burning issue uh, for the 1985 election. What was interesting in Lloydminster in 1985 is that he had just released a report uh, called Plan Lloydminster in 1985. And it was one of these all-encompassing civic long-range documents that, you know, intended to guide the development of the city over the next basically 25 years. And some of the things that Plan Lloyd Minster 1985 predicted have been completely off base, but other things have actually been quite accurate. And, you know, one of the things that I felt was important was that you have somebody on council who, who's, you know, reasonably young, who, you know, at that point, Allison and I didn't have family, but we were certainly planning on having family. And the, the, the intention was to have somebody who could represent a, a lot of other people in Lloydminster, and that was young people, young families who had recently come to Lloydminster, you know, who were working in a variety of different roles, whether it was in, you know, in the oil patch or in agriculture or, you know, as Lakeland College expanded and became more of an entity in Lloydminster. So that's, that was, you know, a big part of the motivation. Um, had you been politically I, 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 active prior to 85? Like, y y it's the first time you put yourself on the ballot, but had you been working on campaigns? Had you been getting to know some of the councillors? Or was this sort of a, not a toe into the water first, but a complete cannonball into the pool and just getting <laughs> your completely self uh, splashed? So, so uh, short answer to that is yes. <laughs> Uh, but there was, uh, I was involved in politics at the provincial level as a teenager. In fact, I served as the vice president of policy for the Edmonton Calder Progressive Conservative Association when I was 16. Um, and it was mostly because we were good friends with both the MLA at the day, the late Tom Chambers, and also with uh, uh, Jim Acton, who's also passed away. But Jim was the president of the of the PC Association, good friend of our families, and they had encouraged me to get involved. Um, over my time at university from the 1977 to 1983, I was focused on my studies and really didn't have much involvement at all uh, politically. Uh, but after graduating, you know, coming to Lloydminster in 1983, you know, you get to know sort of who the players are. Um, Bud Miller was our MLA at that time. Um, the, the mayor of Lloydminster was Bill Condro. And uh, you, you got to know people. And um, it was a situation where, where, you know, like, if you're going to get involved in politics, I mean, I, I, I didn't think provincial politics was, was a reasonable jump at that point. But uh, certainly, uh, uh, civic politics. Uh, you know, I had to go to my I had to go to my partners because you know I had just made partner in the veterinary practice, like not you know a few weeks earlier, and I had to go to my two partners and say, "Hey, I'm thinking of running for city council. Are you good with this? Because it's going to mean time away from the clinic and that sort of thing." And I have to say, both my partners, uh, Dr. Malcolm Gray and Dr. Sue Ashburner, were, were very supportive, and. Um, you know, and and so that was that was very encouraging. And Allison was also extremely supportive. Uh, so you know, we said, you know, what the heck, let's try this. And you know, if if you get elected, fantastic. If you don't get elected, it's a good experience. It's a good way to get to know people, get to know the community. And um, so that's sort of what happened in 1985. So in 1985, I'm assuming the election is in October, if I'm not mistaken, with what you said correctly. Um, you get you get officially declared councillor elect. Um, right. I've spoken to many municipal politicians from across Canada and a lot of provincial politicians across Canada. And all this week, I'm speaking to politicians who went municipally to provincial or provincial to municipal. So this mm -hmm. is a uh, the question I need to ask you. Walking onto that floor of the council chambers the very first time as a councillor elect, you're not sworn in yet. How much of a weight and responsibility do you put on your shoulders to make sure that your decisions that you make are going to best move the city forward, but also realizing that the money you're about to spend is coming from the taxpayers who are your neighbors, your family members, your business friends? How much of a weight and responsibility did you put on yourself to make sure that every decision you make is in the best of the community and not just the best for what you believe is right? 
Uh, Chris, I'd say that the, the gravity of being elected as a municipal representative didn't was something I was not fully aware of when I was first elected. You know, really? at that moment I was being sworn in. I mean, I, I knew that, you know, as city councillor, you'd be responsible for, you know, passing legislation and bylaws and passing a budget and, and all that sort of thing. But, uh, you know, the, 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 the you know, the the nearness of the municipal level of politics to the people it can't be overstated i mean provincial politicians federal politicians you know can go to edmonton can go to ottawa and be somewhat isolated or insulated if you like from the electorate because they're simply not there a lot of the time um, and, and this becomes more so if they become involved at a cabinet level or, you know, have responsibilities, you know, beyond, uh, you know, just being, a, you know, the local representative. Uh, municipally, you don't have that luxury. Uh, you know, you go to pick up the mail, you go to buy groceries, uh, you get buttonholed. Um, you know, I, I got a phone call. I'll never forget this. I got a phone call about a week after I was elected or no, a month after I was elected. It was a Grey Cup Sunday, middle of the Grey Cup, 1985. I'm watching the game and there's a guy phoning me up who wants to complain about the sewer system. And now, what I knew about the Lloydminster sewer system in November of 1985 would fill a very thin book. But all I could do is is listen to him express rather forcefully his his displeasure with the way city was doing things and say you know look i'll look into it i mean i had a lot to learn i had a tremendous amount to learn and and i mean i still look back at those two terms on city council as being you know a tremendous learning experience in terms of the responsibilities of the municipal level of government but a learning experience for me too because you know at the municipal level it's so much about uh, consensus building and working with your colleagues and working to try to forge those relationships that will allow you to move, you know, items forward that are important either to you personally or important to, you know, people who have elected you or people who have approached you as their municipal representative. Do your habits change as a municipal councillor? Because you say you can't go to the grocery store if you're a municipal councillor or an alderman. You can't go pick up the mail. You can't go, I'm going to go run, fill up the tank of gas, gas and come back because you know you're going to be at least gone for an hour, two hours, possibly three. Like, does does the family life suffer when you're a municipal councillor? Because you are you have to be on 24-7 as a municipal councillor unless you're at home and just being a uh, secluded uh, councillor and not going out and uh, interacting with the community uh, i mean sure but that's true of any elected person i i mean it was certainly true for those six years that i was on city council it was also true for the seven years that i was the mla um you know you are the person's representative and you know i will say that for the most part people are very respectful of your personal time personal space i i, I mean I had many instances when I would be, you know, having supper in a restaurant with Allison um, and, and, you know, somebody would come over to the table and their first words were always words of apology or words saying, you know, look, I'm really, really sorry to interrupt you or to, to, to bring this up because I know you're out here just with your wife for a nice evening. Uh, but I do have a concern. How can I get in touch with you to discuss it? And, and you know, I, I'm perfectly fine with that. You know, and I would give you them my card or give them contact information and say, look, phone the office first thing tomorrow morning and we'll chat and and we'll 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 talk about this. But um, but that's 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 being an elected official. Um, if you don't like it, uh, don't put your name on a ballot. Uh, if, if you expect to be able to treat be treated like you live in a glass house and if you're you know, if you're a person who really doesn't want to interact with people, um, being an elected official is is probably not the not the uh, line of work you want to get involved with. But you know, for me, it was easy because as a veterinarian and in practice, I, I was seeing people every day. You know, dozens of people, and, and you know, and and you know, obviously, some of them were from Lloydminster. Uh, a lot of our clients or a lot of our, our our customers in the veterinary practice were rural folks and and you know you know expanding to the area all around Lloydminster on both the Alberta and Saskatchewan sides and those were relationships that over time you built um it, it took time 
uh, you know, I, I, I would sometimes tell my colleagues when I was in MLA, I said, a trust is sort of like a brick wall. You have to build it a brick at a time and, and you can't build a whole wall at once. You build it a brick at a time. But when something damages the wall, it takes a long time to rebuild that trust. And, you know, that that's something that that certainly when I was in veterinary practice, um, you know, I, I we, we work very, very hard to you know build the trust of our clients, of the owners of the pets and, and for the you know people in the livestock industry that we did work for. In 88, you run for re-election. Was it an easy decision to put your name back on the ballot after that first term? Because, like you said, you're kind of a new uh, gun to this whole ordeal of what municipal politics is. Three years under your belt, you say, I'm going to throw my hat back in the ring and try one more time. Or was it a two-term and done issue for yourself? Uh, 1988 was not a really difficult decision. I, I mean, there there was a lot going on in Lloydminster at that time. Um, it was uh, kind of the boom of Lloydminster, if I'm well, not mistaken, right? The, upgr the upgrader had just been announced on the 1st of September of 1988. So, I mean, it was huge. Yeah. And, and so we were you know, very excited. And we had worked in our in my first term, we had worked very hard lobbying with Husky and with the provincial governments and with the federal governments. And of course, we, we were very fortunate to have, you know, people like Don Mazankowski and Bill McKnight as our MPs. I mean, they were major, major players in the Mulroney government. So, no, it wasn't really a hard decision. I mean, Roland had been born in February of that year. So, I mean, we had a, an, you know, still an infant in the whole house. So, you know, at that point, I, I always joke, I say, you know, at that age, they're not that hard, you know, to, to, to take care of. It's when they're up and walking and can pull stuff off the coffee table, you have to be more careful. But uh, uh, no, it was, a, it was a fairly easy decision. And as it turned out, the, the six of us who were on council at the time uh, were all acclaimed. So it was not as difficult an election process. Um, so you didn't and, have to go knock on every door this time. We did not have to go knocking on every door, no. Uh, but we had we also had a very, very good group of people. We had a really good mix of people on council uh, at that point at in 1988. Um, you know, some very experienced councillors, you, know, you know, folks like Cease McKay and, and, and uh, uh, Herb Plieger. Pat Gulak was our mayor, and she certainly had tremendous experience and, and background in Lloyd Minster. So it was a good group. Um, and, and we worked, I thought, quite well together. Uh, didn't mean we agreed on everything. We certainly had disagreements, but but at the end of the day, we would see through, you know, the things we had to do. So, you know, the second term was great. Um, you, you it, mentioned a name here. I just want to I just want to interrupt here for a second because you mentioned sure. a name and you are one of the few people that I've ever been able to interview who have had the pleasure of interacting with Don Mazinkowski. How was he? Was he a good guy? Was he a constituent guy? Because I've heard, I've read books on him. I've read great stories about him, but I've never gotten to talk to someone who actually would probably interacted with him more than you. So how was he as a constituent or because like you said, he was in cabinet, he was always out and he was always doing right. stuff. Uh, Don was an absolutely wonderful gentleman just an absolutely wonderful gentleman. I'll tell you a story about Don. So I mentioned that Roland was born in February of 1988. In May of 1988, so we were three months old, but Roland was three months old. We made a trip out to Eastern Canada. I was visiting some friends in the Toronto area and we went up to Ottawa. And without any appointment, without any free phone call or anything, we walk into Don Mazankowski's office and I'd met Don through city council and through other things. Um, and we, we walk into his office and we talk to his, uh, into his assistant and say, you know, hi, we're constituents from Lloyd Minster. We, we'd really love to, uh, you know, have just a minute to say hi, hello to, you know, you know Mr. Mazikowski, who by this time is the deputy prime minister. And, um, you know, not expecting necessarily that we're going to, you know, be able to see him. Don, uh, the assistant goes into Don's office and he comes out shakes our hand, you know, welcomes Roland, you know, tickles Roland under the chin type thing. And we spend the next hour in Don's office. You know, wow. he sure as heck didn't have us on his appointment schedule that day, but we were important enough to him that he was prepared to spend that time. And I'll never forget that. And um, I, I, well, not to interrupt, but I kind of see you doing that because 
And I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass here, Richard, but every time that I called you, whenever I needed an uh, interview or if I needed something, you you stopped what you were doing and you called me back. And not that many poli- not that many politicians I've ever interacted with through my journalism career, through my municipal career would ever do that. So did you kind of try to emulate what Don did when you went to Ottawa and give time to your constituents? Well, when people ask me who my political mentors are, Chris, I, I, I give them two names, Don Mazankowski and Peter Lougheed. Those are the two people. Now, I had much less interaction and contact with, with Premier Lougheed. Um, you know, met him a few times as a young progressive conservative, um, was, was very saddened that he decided to leave the provincial field in 1986. Uh, but uh, Lougheed rightly was voted Canada's best premier ever. And and I mean that was that was a landslide when they did that poll. I mean by by a long shot, uh, there will never be another Peter Lougheed. And um, so you know certainly in terms of his abilities, his his vision, um, you know that was something. But but in terms of you know interaction with constituents and and how to handle yourself, Don Mazankowski was was the epitome of that to me, as as a young person as a you know yes a person who was an elected official but as a constituent and in 1993 when when don uh, retired from politics uh i i remember i was asked to speak in vegreville at the unveiling of a bronze statue that they had commissioned uh for the this uh, for the town of vegreville and uh i was actually surprised i mean they could have asked anybody and here they asked me out of the blue to give the the main address at this unveiling ceremony but what was interesting was the video tributes that they played that night from all over, you know, from George Bush from the United States, um, you know, various uh, Canadian uh, uh, federal figures from, from both sides of the aisle, you know, from all parties. Don was someone who was absolutely beyond reproach, you know, like, like his, his ethics, his moral, you know, his integrity was untouchable. He could be tough. He absolutely could be tough and he could play political hardball. But it was it was almost impossible to dislike the guy. And and you know, that was the truth. And, and and to be truthful, Chris, Don and I stayed in touch for years and years afterwards. And and my last my last time it was very memorable. My last time that I spent a lot of time with him is I actually had a meeting with him in his home in Sherwood Park in 2016 when I was running for the um, PC leadership. Don had invited me and we we spent, again, probably two and a half hours in his office just talking about what's happening in Alberta, what his view of what needed to happen going forward um, you know, on the walls, there's his honorary degrees, there's pictures of him. And, you know, there's a picture of him and Brian Mulroney saying, you know, to Don, my trusted friend and, you know, like stuff like that. Um, you know, I was very saddened when Don passed away a couple of years ago. Uh, he is um, like to me, he's he's the epitome of the gentleman politician, you know, a guy who played the game hard, but, you know, did it fairly. And at the end of the day, after, you know, in his case, 25 years in politics came out completely unscathed, you know, no, no scandal, no, you know, nothing, you know, and, and, and I think people, you know, I think it'd be correct to say that people loved Don Masinkowski more after he left than then even when he was first elected. And interestingly, Don was elected, first elected when he was 33 years old. So he was very young, yeah. you know, so, uh, no, Don Masinkowski and I had a, I mean, we had a very, very good relationship, and and I, I consider him for sure one of my two political mentors. Going back to Lloyd Minster here for a second before we turn provincially, in uh, after the second election where you're claimed, you decide uh, I'm not I'm not sure, and this is where you might have to fill me in on some details here, Richard is. You either leave politics or you're defeated or you just don't stand for re-election. What happens in that third election? Do you just because at this time, I'm assuming you now have two young kids. You yep. have a very budding uh, uh, business practice that you're working in. And I can imagine life gets to you and you have to lose one thing. Well, well you've pretty much identified it, Chris. 1991 came around. Um, Allison and I, by this time, Roland is three. Alistair is a year and a half. 
Um, by 1991, Allison and I were now the sole owners of Lloyd Mr. Animal Hospital. In 1985, I was a junior partner uh, with two other partners. In 1988, one of those partners had left, but I was still, you know, in a partnership with another veterinarian. By 1991, Allison and I we're shouldering the entire ownership management, you know, load at the animal hospital. And we had two young boys who were now, you know, three and a half and one and a half. And we're certainly at this point, much more active in their various activities. And yeah, you're right. Something had to give. And um, while I had really enjoyed being on city council, the, the, the choice was fairly clear um, that that's, you know, if something had to give, it was going to be city council. So I did not run for re-election in 1991. Uh, I announced my intentions to do to not run fairly early in the game because, you know, as I said that night, I said, rightly or wrongly, incumbents are are viewed as having an advantage, especially in municipal politics. And so in our situation, Allison and I made the decision that, you know, I would announce early so that anyone who was contemplating making a run would know that at least one of the incumbents was not going to be running again. Looking and back so on the, looking back Sorry, on this, ahead. looking back on those six years, what was the one thing you you're you're happy you were able to push through with council or get on the agenda during those six years? Uh, I think one of the things that I was very involved with, w- which has now gone through a couple of different iterations, but at the time it was the Bar Colony Heritage Cultural Center. Now, this is the large museum complex on the east end of the city. I was chair of the building committee and involved oh, wow. with fundraising for it and i mean unfortunately it has gone through a couple of different iterations now and, and i'm not I'm not entirely happy with some of the decisions that have been made about how that building now functions but nonetheless it is a marvelous facility um and it will continue to serve the people well for a long long time i, I was also involved with the construction of the legacy center the senior center in lloydminster and um you know, actually worked on the building committee and worked very closely with uh, the architect, uh, Paul Couillard, who who made a wonderful design on that building and <laughs> subsequently designed the house that I now live in. So uh, Paul, Paul became a good friend. And um, so, you know, that those are things that, that I, I, I feel very good about. Um, you know, th- there were there were a lot of things going on in Lloydminster at that time. Uh, but ultimately, we had uh, the responsibility to, you know, be good stewards. You talked about, you know, we're spending taxpayers' money. And one of my absolute platforms, the first time I ran, and it continued to be right throughout, was I'm a steward of your funds. This is, this is not my money. This is your money I'm spending. And I take that responsibility very seriously. Um, after you stepped down in 1991, you're no longer an elected official. Is the bug still there? Because you are one of the people that have actually said, okay, I'm retiring from politics. You've never been defeated. So therefore you've never been kicked out of office. You have just literally left office. So I I find it interesting when I ask the question, does the bug still stay with you after 1991? Say, you know what? I need to spend time with my family, but one day I'm going back into that arena because it's calling me. Uh, yeah, the bug was the bug is was there, uh, but um, I, I certainly pushed that bug. I, I deferred that bug. Um, you know, I mentioned that that gathering in 1993 for Don Mazikowski. The next morning, I got a call from Don, um, uh, encouraging me to seek the federal con- progressive conservative nomination for the Vegreville constituency and run in the 1993 election. And I was approached by a number of other people in Lloydminster who wanted me to run for the federal nomination. Um, you know, I, I said, look, guys, you know, young family, I'm not in a position to, you know, be in Ottawa all the time. And then I was approached again in 2000 when uh, uh, when uh, Steve West. Uh, the MLA of the day um, said that he was not going to run again and that there was going to be a contested nomination for Vernalene and Lloyd Minster. Um, We were actually living in Germany at the time and I was on sabbatical and I got started getting phone calls from back home from various people who said, Richard, we really would like to see you run for the nomination for MLA. And, you know, I I basically said the same thing. Guys, uh, I have other things that right now are higher priorities, family 
uh, my practice, uh, notwithstanding that I had taken a sabbatical year from the practice, but I wanted to make sure that that was still, you know, a going concern. Uh, you know, by that time, by 2000, uh, I had excellent partners um, who were very good at stepping up and, and, and looking after things while, while we were away. And, uh, you know, my, my sons were still home and, and very much a big part of my life and wanted, I wanted that to stay that way. So it really wasn't until, you know, 20, um, 20, at the end of 2011, you know, by this time, uh, you know, Roland's 23 and attending university, Alistair's 21 out of the house attending university. It's, it's Allison and me and Liesl and the cats. And, and so, you know, by then, uh, you know, sort of some of the other responsibilities had, had, you know, sort of, you know, pulled back a little bit. And then, then what ended up happening is then the decision was, you know, I had, I had actually made the decision that I was planning on retiring from a retinue practice. And, um, you know, and then the opportunity came about as a result of, of Lloyd Snellgrove indicating that he was not going to seek uh, re-election in the next election, which, you know, was certainly connected to the fact that Alison Redford somewhat unexpectedly won the uh, progressive conservative leadership. Uh, Lloyd had uh, supported Gary Marr. Uh, Gary Marr was widely expected to win that leadership. Um, he did not. And uh, Alison Redford won the leadership, which was certainly unexpected. In 2011 or 2012, uh, you are the nominee for the Progressive Conservative Ooh. Association of Alberta in the riding of Vermillion Lloyd Minster. Um, politics municipally are completely different uh, provincially because municipally you're running as an independent candidate. I don't mm -hmm. care who you are. You're an independent. Does politics change for you when you get into that different arena of po provincial politics for you, or is it still the same and you still treat it the exact same way? I'm going to go knock on every single door. I'm going to try and be the best constituents person if I have to. And I'm going to make sure that people know that I'm their MLA, even if they don't vote for me. Uh, well, that that's that's exactly it. Um, yes, uh, you know, once you get to the provincial level or federal level, you're talking about party politics and you're part of a team. Um, but ultimately, you're the person that the constituents has to call on when they have a concern. You are their you are their representative, and you are their representative whether they voted for you or not. And I know that there were a lot of people that we did an awful lot of work for out of our offices in Vermilion and Lloydminster during the seven years that I was MLA that I knew full well. In fact, a lot of times they <laughs> volunteered the information. They didn't vote for me, you know, and that's fine. Uh, you know, I, I was, you know, like I say, I was, I was fine with that. You know, who they decided to vote for, that's their decision. And I respect that. But once you're elected, you have to represent everybody. You have to represent everybody. And if you think you can get by just looking after the folks that support, supported you and ignore or give short shrift to everybody else, um, well, I, I just don't think that's responsible. Uh, I don't think that's that's how elected representation should work. Uh, so no, um, yeah, you know, 2012 rolls around. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, ask I, the inappropriate question right now, and I'm gonna ask it yeah. in a weird way. Richard, when you decided to put your name forward provincially, did you have a desire to be a cabinet minister, or would you be okay being just an MLA for Vermilion Lloyd Minster? Um, <laughs> this is gonna sound cliche. I was perfectly happy to take on any role that I was given. Um, uh, you know, I, I mean, obviously, my first goal was to get elected. Uh, if you don't get elected, yeah, that's like <laughs> that. um, but my first, my first goal was get elected as the MLA and we were successful. We, we campaigned very hard. We, we were running, we were playing catch up the whole time because, um, uh, other parties had nominated, well, at least one other party had nominated their candidate a long time ahead of time. And they had already extensively door knocked throughout the constituency. I had not. Uh, and we knew that the election was coming in in, in the spring of, uh, of of 2012. We we knew that it was coming, and we didn't have a whole lot of time. Uh, so you know, we worked very hard leading up to that election in late April of 2012. Um, when the first cabinet was announced, uh, you know, I, I remember being asked, you know, are you disappointed that you were left out of cabinet? 
And I said, boy, you know, I, I think I got a whole lot to learn before, you know, I get put into a cabinet role. And yes, there were some MLAs who would run for the first time and they had been named to cabinet. And, you know, that's fine. That's the, you know, I, I, I always say, you know, service in cabinet, you serve at the pleasure of the premier. Uh, but when uh, when I was called, uh, you know, nine months later uh, by Alison Redford and uh, asked if I would be willing to take on the role of Minister of Tourism, Parks and Recreation. I mean, I jumped all over that. I, I mean, for one, yes, I wanted to be in cabinet. By then, I felt this was something that I could I could do and do a good job of. And secondly, because Tourism, Parks and Recreation is is the best job in cabinet, period. Uh, I mean, I, I, I know someone who would agree with part of that statement, <laughs> the tourism part of that statement. Well, well, and the interesting thing, Chris, is that the parks and recreation side of that, which since that time have unfortunately been hoved off into other ministries. Uh, but those three things had a real synergy. And to a certain extent, I was disappointed to see that uh, I was actually the last Minister of Tourism, Parks and Recreation that Alberta has had because when ca cabinet was redesigned in uh, the fall of 2014 by uh, the late Jim Prentice, um, he decided to put parks in with environment and and tourism was uh, uh, combined with culture. And, and, and there is synergy between tourism and culture for sure. Um, but the tourism portfolio is, is one that I am concerned consistently, at least in Alberta, gets short shrift. Um, and it's and it's because we seem to be so focused on other industries that, yes, they are larger industries and yes, they employ more people. Uh, but the thing I always told people about tourism, and, and I know Ricardo felt the same way, is that the beauty of the tourism industry is it gives Albertans the chance to tell our story to people from around the world, but also to other Albertans. And, and those are wonderful stories. I mean, there's so many fantastic stories, you know, in every little community you go to in Alberta. And, you know, it, 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 it saddens me when, when I see tourism lumped in, you know, with other portfolios, but it's very much sort of the secondary thing. You know, right now, what is it? It's, it's forestry, uh, parks and tourism. So tourism and parks are together again, which is good, but tourism is, is, is not the number one priority. And, and it's, it's, it's sad in my view. So this is going to be kind of a subtle thank you to you, but, you made tourism to me kind of what this show is about. So when I sit down with municipal leaders from across Canada, particularly in Alberta, I always ask them the tourism question because I always want to know what they, how they showcase their community. And I learned that from you because when I interviewed you during my time at, in Lloyd Minster, you always talked about tourism. You always said it was the most important thing because people from all over the world will come to your community if you sell it correctly. And I always try to see how municipal councillors uh, sell their communities through tourism. And it's fascinating. So I, I thank you for teaching me and my husband as well, because he'll tell me if I don't say his name, he'll shoot me. But you were the reason why I kind of wanted tourism to be a big aspect of this show was because you kind of taught me in 2013 when I first got there that tourism is important. So thank you. Well, you're welcome. But I mean, tourism, uh, it, it was an easy role for me. Um, and, and, you know, I talked about the number of visitors that we had, you know, family members, uh, friends, relatives, mostly from Germany, who visited us in Edmonton when I was growing up in our family home, and mom and dad loading up the car with my aunt or, you know, with whoever it was that was visiting, um, and heading out and showing them Alberta. And and it was wonderful. I mean, we would go to Drumheller and show them the Badlands, and we would show them Banff and Jasper and Lake Louise, and and we would, you know, go up north, and they would, you know, see the miles and miles and miles of boreal forest. And you know, there were just so many things to see. And, and so when, you know, like I say, when, when I was then asked to take on this role, 
And one of my one of my big responsibilities, just because of what had happened in 2012, um, coming out of the London Olympics, is that the very large German tourism company operator Der Tour um, had decided to have their what they call their institute in Alberta. And so they brought 300 of their top tourism officials. They fly them to Alberta so that they can learn about what there is to promote in Alberta as a tourism destination. You know, this was fantastic. And, you know, to make matters better, the tourism minister of the day could speak to them in their language. So when I welcomed them to the banquet that we had in Calgary, uh, when they first arrived on a minus 35 day, you know, it was, it was bitterly cold. And here we are sitting at the um, the, the Pulse uh, Center uh, in, in North Calgary, and uh, and and you know I get introduced and I get up on stage and I say a few words in English. But I always enjoyed doing this with with crowds that had German speakers in it. I then switch to German, just like now, and and I am fluent in German. So I, I start rattling off German. I tell a couple of jokes in German that, that I'm, I'm laughing because none of my, my chief of staff, none of my staff knows anything that I'm saying. And so, you know, I could be saying something completely off color or whatever, and they would never know. And, and we, we had this wonderful, wonderful interaction with these German tour guides. And I spent a lot of time you know, promoting Canada as a tourism destination, specifically that year, certainly our focus was on Germany. But I mean, since that time, I mean, we, 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 you know, we are seeing growing numbers of tourists coming to Alberta from a number of different locations. You know, China's a huge growing market. Germany, uh, the UK, um, Netherlands are still very important. But, you know, also the United States, um, we, we welcome lots and lots and lots of tourists from the U.S. And, uh, you know, for, for, for a lot of very, very good reasons. Uh, so, so I'm going to uh, ask you a poignant question here. I'm going to ask the former ahead. Minister of Tourism a question here, because I always like to know about the hidden gems. So in your mm. travels across this province, as the Minister of Tourism, Parks and Recreation, what was the mm. hidden gem that most people don't know about? Because you mentioned Drumheller, the Boreal Forest, Jasper, Banff, Lake Louise. Yes, those are the staples. But what was the one place you went, this is the undiscovered part of this province that needs to a little bit more story? Uh, that's easy, Chris. Uh, writing on Stone Provincial Park. Or, or in in the indigenous language, Isanapi. It is magical. It is an absolutely magical place that hardly anyone has been to. You know, it, it yes, it does get a reasonable level of visitation. Uh, and one of the things I know I worked very hard on was to try to get it designated as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And we didn't get that ball across the goal line. But Minister Phillips, Shannon Phillips, got that done, um, uh, you know, after. And, uh, you know, that that was, to me, a, a wonderful, wonderful uh, achievement. Um, yeah, if you have not been, and I tell many, many people this, if you've not been to Writing on Stone uh, Provincial Park, you are missing something truly magical. And it, and it is just, on the list of things that I need to do this year now. <laughs> yeah, well, there you go. Put put it put it right on the list. I mean, it's a bit of a hike. <laughs> I mean, it straddles the U.S. border. It's way, way, way down south, and um, you know you have to be committed to, to, to make that trip and get there. But boy, I'll I'll tell you, it's it's incredible. I mean, and don't get me wrong, there, there's a hundred other places that I could name in Alberta that that I love. Um, uh, the, the area around Bovey Lakes and, and, you know, the whole castle area that, you know, correctly. And, and I told the minister this, she thought, she thought I was off my nut. Um, you know, six months after the NDP government was elected in 2015, they designated the castle, you know, to the level of protection that I wanted to see it get. And we, you know, for various reasons could not get there. And minister Phillips got that done. And, you know, I, I said, this is the right thing to do. Way to go. Congratulations. You know, this was fantastic. Um, you know, th there's a tiny, tiny little place up north of high level called Notikawin Provincial Park. Unbelievable. Uh, Chris, from your time in uh, Slave Lake, um, the, the, you know, the, the, uh, um, 
the provincial parks around Slave Lake are absolutely fantastic. Those they're gorgeous. I mean, Lesser Slave Lake itself is an absolutely gorgeous body of water, yeah. and yes, it gets a fair number of visitors. Uh, but you know, I, I don't think it probably gets the visitors that say Sylvan Lake or Gall Lake or you know some of the you know the, the lakes that are maybe a little bit closer to Edmonton, a little bit warmer. Uh, but Slave Lake is you know Lesser Slave Lake is just gorgeous. And, and the the, and... the one issue with Lesser Slave Lake, and every council member will tell you this from the day, and we're getting off topic, but I'm going to say this quick story and then we'll get going. But the issue with Lesser Slave Lake, especially on Devonshire Beach, which is the big beach in Lesser Slave mm-hmm. Lake on the uh, east side of the lake near Slave Lake, right. is it's not groomed properly, right? So it's 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 a hike to get into. It's not like Sylvan Lake where you literally drive up to the front of the beach. You have to drive on a paved. So it's always been a contentious issue for council. And they always try to do something. It's just, yeah, how do you spend money after money to try to fix something that locals are like, leave it as is. So... <laughs> Yeah, no, no, it, it's a challenge. It's a yeah. challenge. But I mean, like, like, you know, the Martin River Provincial Park, and then, you know, on the other side, like the Provincial Park, you know, these are, you know, Young's Point, another gorgeous spot. When I was Parks Minister, one of the commitments I made was to try to visit as many of the Provincial Parks as I could. And I'll never forget, in mid-June of 2013, Alice and I are camping on the north side of the Lesser Slave Lake. And I had gone around, there weren't very many people camping because it's still June, so it wasn't really full. And I went around and I just visited and I was handing out, you know, Alberta Parks promotional material. And and there was uh, a group of Filipino campers. Um, uh, They were from the Philippines. They were working in Canada, but they, they, you know, they were camping. This was fantastic. And so we chatted and that sort of thing. And I don't know if it was Allison that told them or they found out somehow uh, else that it was my birthday so we're sitting around the campfire that night, um, and all of a sudden, they come, they come walking up, not driving, but they come walking up, and they've got a guitar, and they're singing happy birthday to me, um, you know, as we're sitting around the campfire. And, and I mean, you know, how wonderful was that? It was, you know, it was, it, it, there, there's just so much that we have in this province um, to share with, with, with other Albertans, for sure. Uh, but with with the world, with with other Canadians and with with visitors from around the world, and uh, you know, tourism is is something that uh, it was important to me even before I was elected. Um, so when I was named tourism minister, I was absolutely thrilled because it was something that was I was passionate about, and uh, I, I was disappointed uh, that uh, when when uh, Mr. Prentice became uh, premier, that he made some changes in cabinet, and that I was no longer minister. But that that's the way things are. You spend another five years after you leave cabinet, after Jim Prentice gets elected, <laughs> and four years of that in opposition, where you lose two good people that you know. The late Jim Prentice passes away from a tragic plane accident, but also. During your time, your caucus, the PC caucus, loses one of its own, Mamit Bular, um, mm-hmm. in a tragic accident on Highway 2 between Edmonton and Calgary near Red Deer. Um, that changes people when you lose people like that, particularly Mamit Bular, because he is sitting in uh, caucus with you. Oh, oh, I, I don't want to talk about that day because it's always hard to talk about that. But I want to know from your opinion, because I talked to you about Don Meskowski. So what was Mamit like as a person? Because I live in the riding he used to represent. So Mamit was physically large and he was, how do you say it? Spiritually large. He was just a big personality he was just you know he was he was the kind of person that people just gravitated towards just because of his force of his the sheer force of his personality um and i remember him talking about uh going to nepal to spend time uh after the uh, the earthquakes they had there this was shortly before he was killed in the accident um uh, Manmeet was interesting. We didn't always agree. I mean, this is the other thing I, I want to make sure that, you know, it, it's not like he and I agreed on everything. 
Uh, what? But... Everyone doesn't agree on everything in a caucus? You don't say. Oh, gosh, <laughs> no, let me tell you. But no, Manmeet was was a wonderful guy. And uh, I mean, like everybody, even that day was just a gut punch. Um, you know, I, I have to say that uh, two people from the government caucus that were exceedingly supportive and kind to us in PC caucus on that day, or at least especially to me, uh, were uh, Darren Billis and Brian Mason, um, both Darren and, and Brian. Darren was the first person who let us know that there was something that had happened. And Brian was transportation minister. And uh, so he had some more information and he invited me to his office and we sat together and, and you know, for the next hour or so until more news came because I, as house leader, I was, you know, sort of responsible, but uh, uh, it was a, it was a, it was a, it was a horrific, it was a horrific day. Uh, it was a horrific week. I, I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget that week. Uh, you know, I won't forget going down the next day to visit with Minmeet's family. All of us as caucus went down, we flew down and um, then flew back. And, and I don't think we came back into the chamber until the Thursday, if I'm, if I've got my days right. Um, but even then, Mamit sat in the middle of our caucus. There were nine of us. So we had three rows of three. And, you know, guess who had the middle square and Hollywood squares? It was Mamit. And that was not an accident. He was the heart and the soul of that caucus. Um, you know, we, we, you know, we had, we had, we had a group of people that really, you know, were, were quote unquote survivors. I mean, the PC, the PC caucus had been reduced from 70 members to nine. You know, so obviously the, the you know, the nine of us kind of had survivor mentality and, and you know, seven of those uh, caucus members were from Calgary. Um, and, and we had Wayne Drysdale and myself were the only, you know, MLAs from outside of Calgary, PC MLAs that were reelected in 2015. So it was, uh, it was, you know, it was, it was one of those things and, you know, uh I remember exactly where I was the morning that, that I'd heard that uh, Jim Prentice had been killed um, and the circumstances. And it was, it was actually early in the leadership campaign. It was in October of 2016. And my first thought when I heard that news was that here's a man who has devoted a significant portion of his life to public service. And, you know, yes, the, the, the defeat in the election had been a, a, a big disappointment, obviously. I spoke to Jim shortly after the election, and he was certainly very, very disappointed. But here was a guy who was now going to be able to spend time with, with, with Karen and with his daughters and, and grandchildren and, and be, you know, do all those family and sports things that he had never really had much time to do during all those years that he was either a, a, you know elected official or you know in his time in the corporate world and here he was you know 60 years old and his life's cut short and uh, uh that was the tragedy to me um that was you know to, to have Manmeet and and jim both die within 11 months of each other um you know, I, I think I said at the time, I said, somewhere in heaven, two old friends are enjoying a drink, which is only partly true because Mamit didn't drink. But, uh, well, he's just uh, drinking water. They, uh, they, they, well, and I can remember Jim being at, at Mamit's parents' place uh, that night um, that Mamit had been killed. And uh, Jim just saying, I've lost my best friend. He says, Richard, Mamit was my best friend. And, um, it, you know, those are the relationships that that are often forged in the political arena that we we don't always hear about, uh, we don't always know about, but but they are um, they are relationships that are very very strong, and um, you know you, you value them because these are people that you've gotten to know you know quite well, and um, sometimes you know people that you haven't necessarily always agreed with, but people who you know would go to the wall for you. And uh, uh, Manmeet was that, um, you know, and, and Jim, you know, and, and, you know, and, you know, sadly, we've had other colleagues that uh, uh, have, have passed, you know, in recently Aaron Babcock from the last legislature, um, 
uh, Janice Sarich has passed away. And, and, you know, it's, it's, it's sad, you know, that, that, uh, you know, some of your four former colleagues, uh, uh, have passed, but, uh, you, uh, you feel blessed for the time you had to, to spend with them and, and, and the lessons you learned from them. So we are coming up to the hour mark and I told you we'd only be 45 minutes. So that tells you how much a good friends we are. We can just pass time like that. Uh, I want to turn to my last sort of two questions that I have for you here, Richard. Sure. And the first one is this. You've had an extensive career, whether it be through volunteerism, whether it be at City Hall, whether it be at the Legislative Assembly. Looking back, what do you want to be remembered for the most? Or even as a father, as a husband, what do you want to be remembered as? Um. I think the the thread that goes through all of my different involvements, whether it's you know the volunteer work or my work at the clinic and owning a business or my time as an elected official, uh, the thread that links all of those together is that that you know if people you know are are, are talking about me, I, I appreciate when they say he was uh, he was ethical. He acted with integrity and he was compassionate. Those are the things that are important to me. Um, sure, there's 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 all kinds of things that you did or achieved or managed or you know whatever it was. Um, I still get emails from people who know that I had a fairly significant role to make sure that the Kananaskis golf course got rebuilt. Uh, there's a lot of people who didn't want to see that golf course restored after the 2013 floods. Um, but I was, I was certainly in cabinet pushing very hard that that was an important resource that belonged to Albertans and that should be rebuilt. And it was, and that was good. It was good that that decision was followed through with. And, uh, now that course is open again. And, and when I, I, I get emails or pictures or, you know, people that have played the course and, you know, it, it's, it's people that know that I was involved. And, you know, they send me a note and says, thanks, this was an amazing experience. And, and, you know, that's just one of uh, a number of things, you know, there are so many things that you do that you can't really single out because they're just, they're just things that are important to that person. So they'll never be in the newspaper. They'll never show up on a resume or anything like that. But, you know, a family member who was having an issue accessing, you know, care or a support of some sort and if you could help them jump through the hoops a little quicker or if you could knock down some of the hurdles so that they'd have an easier time of getting the support that their family member needed that was ultimately incredibly satisfying and all of that happens when you're acting from a base of of compassion and acting from a base of I, I have to show integrity and to, to absolutely be relied upon. And, and, you know, that was something that Don Mazankowski demonstrated to me as, as an elected official, you know, he, he was somebody, he, he, his word was his bond. You could absolutely if Don said it was, it was period. And, um, and so those, like I say, that was the thing. And I mean, that goes back, right to my parents i mean my parents were the same way uh do your job do it really well and do it in a way that's reliable last question for you because all this week we've had politicians on who like i said went from municipal to provincial provincial to municipal or even federal um your time in municipal politics did it better prepare you for your role as a provincial mla uh, hugely, absolutely, and and in fact, um, I mean, I I, I talk about uh, often, and I would talk, you know, after I was elected as an MLA, whenever I met with municipal officials, I made sure that they knew that I had served as a city councilor in Lloydminster for two terms, because immediately they said, okay, so then you get us, you understand us, because the municipal world is a very challenging one. Um, you know, they can't run deficits like provincial or federal governments. So they, they have very, very limited sources of revenue. And so the municipal level of government is one that's closest to the people. Uh, as a municipal official, you cannot hide and, and you have, you know, a tremendous responsibility. And so that's six, those six years that I spent on Lloyd Minster City Council 
really helped prepare me in a huge way for when I was in, in, in provincial politics. I mean, yes, obviously there are differences, but, um, you know, the basic uh, principles of representation of the public and, and, and stewardship of the taxpayer dollars that you've been entrusted with, uh, those carry through. And, um, and I, you know, I, 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 those were responsibilities I treated extremely uh, seriously, uh, and and so yeah, you know, in the short in the short answer, did it help? Well, you bet it did. And uh, I mean, I know many of my colleagues when I served in the provincial legislature had municipal experience. You know, people like Jackie Fenske and Kathy Olson and Ron Casey and Ken Lemke and you know many 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 others had you know george vanderberg had been mayor up in white court for you know a long long time um you know these were all people who had had experience or you know the other field that a lot of times people were had experience with was at the school board level uh, maureen kubinek uh, the mla for barhead Morville westlock um you know very very active in, in the uh, uh in the municipal or at the school board level so um no th those other levels of government are are very important there I, I don't like to treat them as sort of training grounds because i mean they are they are different and they have a, a an importance all unto themselves um you know and and you know we see you know the current mayor of edmonton mayor sogi i mean was a federal cabinet minister you know served a term as a federal mp and is now mayor of the city of edmonton and um i got to know amarji quite well um over the time that i was tourism minister and 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 still have a chat with him from time to time um he's, he's a wonderful wonderful person we, we we don't necessarily politically always align on every issue but but as a person Amarjeet and, and his wife Sarbjeet are just wonderful people and uh uh you know I I I certainly hope the best for him you know in his you know role which is challenging Richard, the Honorable Richard Starkey, I want to thank you so much. Yes, I have to say the Honorable because my husband is now the Honorable Ricardo Miranda. So for the yes. remainder of time, you guys will be the Honorable to me. But the Honorable Richard Starkey, I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for making this an amazing 500th episode of the Cross Border Interviews. I want to thank you so much for sitting down, taking time out of your busy day and just doing this with me because I wouldn't have asked for a better person to ring in 500 episodes with. Well, well, Chris, uh, thank you again. It's been a real pleasure. We could go for another hour easily, I'm sure. And uh, here's all the best to you for another 500 episodes, my friend. Um, we we are we are in German. We say wir drücken die Daumen. Like in English, we cross our fingers, but in German, the saying is wir drücken die Daumen, and we, we we're pressing our thumbs. So I'm pressing my thumbs for you, my friend. Well, thank you so much. So with that. This has been the 500th episode of the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. I want to remind everyone, put down social media, put down Twitter, put down Facebook, put down whatever you have, and go have a conversation with somebody. It helps our society, it helps our democracy, and it helps us be a better people at the end of the day. So with that, this has been the Cross Border Interviews with Chris Brown. We are back in February, February 13th. We are starting our new year-long series of municipal leaders from across Canada, so please tune in on February 13th for another great episode. So with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking.